Hi, and thank you for watching. My name is Dana Mann, and I am a graduate student at Jacksonville State University, University in Jacksonville, Alabama. And today, my lecture is to discuss insect symbiosis with Bucknera and Wolbachia as the examples. So, let's get started. Now, first, the basic definition for symbiosis is the relationship between two unlike organisms for some common common goal. Now there's three very separate distinct categories in symbiosis. The first one is mutualism where both parties try and benefit. Now the classic example is the clownfish and the anemone. How the clownfish eats the bacteria off the anemone while the anemone provides the clownfish with protection from prey. Now that's a very good example, but even more defined in that is obligate mutualism, where both parties will not develop without the presence of the other. For instance, you have the fig tree and the fig wasp. Fig tree needs the fig wasp to pollinate, and the fig wasp needs to have the seeds uh, for the reproduction to occur. Now besides mutualism, the next category is commensalism, which means eating at the same table. And an example of that would be the alligator and the pover bird. Now how the pover bird probably just eats from the alligator, but really the alligator doesn't get any direct benefit from that. All it is is getting providing the bird with a table to eat, practically. And the last one, in the category of symbiosis, the one that most people probably know and more common with is parasitism, where one organism benefits at the expense of the other. Uh, for instance, you'll see a mosquito that will eat off of a human for blood, for nutrition, or you have a tapeworm that does the same thing, but there's many other examples in the symbiosis that has to do with parasitism all, all over the animal kingdom. Now, more focused back into my symbiosis talk is uh, symbiotic bacteria and their insect associations. Now, insects, very wide, very wide kingdom. Uh, there's a lot of insects that have symbiosis. In fact, they need symbiosis to, to develop. Uh, certain associations they have include development, uh, which I will include with Wolbachia uh, very soon. Uh, but you also have nutrition. Uh, with Bugnera. I'll show you an example for that in a minute. But also reproduction and defense. Now one interesting concept in uh, another lecture, if you check my channel, is the squid symbiosis with fisheri, Vibrio fisheri. How it needs Vibrio fisheri as a defensive mechanism where the prey looking at the squid from above will actually notice that it is silhouetted uh, with the moonlight. Now in insect symbiosis there's two categories also. You have primary symbionts which first they travel horizontally from one organism to the other from parent to offspring and that's usually in a nutritional aspect like for Bucknera, as I'll discuss in a moment, its primary uh, primary role is for amino acid synthesis. Now the next category in uh, insect back in insect symbiont is the secondary symbiont, which is first of all it's laterally or horizontally transferred from one organism to the other uh, through horizontal transmission from one to the other usually through some other mechanism than, than reproduction. Right? Now, going further in depth, uh, just, a, just a brief example of more symbiotic bacteria is that there are intermits between uh, free living bacteria and bacteria derived organelles which means that these two examples are sort of in between uh, the free-living 
uh, like E. coli or salmonella, but they're not exactly just like the organelles, for instance, chloroplasts and mitochondria. Now, two examples include that they do have reduced genome, just like uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts, which mitochondria and chloroplasts, they sort of trade off their, their genes to their host while as everything or as certain things turn off in their gene gene pool. And also they uh, have metabolic capabilities that are similar to free living bacteria. However, it's not as available or it's not as prominent as it once was. As it gets more and more specialized, you'll see it probably turn off more and more, but I'll get to that in a second. Also, these, these symbionts, Wolbachian bacteria, are able to live uh, outside their host for a limited amount of time, not as much as free swimming bacteria, such as E. coli, Salmonella, as my previous examples, but definitely much longer than mitochondria and chloroplasts, which cannot live outside of their host cells. All right. And also the relationship age is in line in between free living and organelles. All right. Now, right here I have a few pictures of Bucknera. I have the very top one right over here, as you can see, is of an aphid, which is its primary host. Then I have right here, uh, to my right, or the left, is Wolbachia in the huge vacuole of the of the host, and then here it's much more pronounced. Now, a few quick short facts about Bucknera is that its relationship first started with its primary host, aphids, around 84 to 280 million years ago. It's a wide range. It is, of course, only found in aphids because its primary role is in amino acid biosynthesis, as I'll show you in a second in the next slide. Yeah, it's one of the few genome sequence of symbionts, which makes it very large in its importance to biologists since it helps us understand other uh, symbionts. Now, what they discovered while they were mapping the genome of uh, Bucknera is that it has a lot of genes that help regulate amino acid biosynthesis. However, uh, where it lacks in some amino acid degradation that are non-essential, Bucknera will basically synthesize uh, what the aphids cannot, and the aphids will synthesize what Bucknera cannot. Now, what they also found uh, during the gene content mapping is that Bucknera lost its DNA at a very significant rate, somewhat extreme, uh, that shows somewhat specialization. In fact, I'll show you uh, in later slides that it seems to be going more in line with uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts and no symbionts in, in that way. Now, Bucknera is, like I said, its primary role is in amino acid synthesis. Now, as the aphids, they get most of their nutrition from sap, which is very high in nitrogen, but not in primary amino acids, which is where it where Bucknera comes in. It actually over-regulates uh, essential amino acids, namely tryptophan, e.g., and leucine A through leucine D, leucine A, B, C, D. Now, it also helps uh, affect rates between Bucknera and its aphid host, they actually discover that the aphid's host somehow regulate Bucknera's overproduction in a way. They haven't really found out why, but as biologists progress and research more, they'll understand. In current research with Bucknera, they discover it's very important to the development for its aphid host. In this one research I read, actually antibiotics introduced into the aphids 
stunted the growth of the aphids. See, it disrupted their development. As uh, they destroyed the Bucknera, it was not able to reproduce the amino acid that it desperately needed from the foam sap, so it could overexpress what it needed. And they discovered that even nutritional supplementation was not adequate. Uh, it wasn't living long even after it, it just growth just continued to to plummet. Now what this means is that potentially diet specification would be necessary otherwise the they would just become extinct. In other words if Bucknera becomes more and more specialized of course if you take out Bucknera from the equation then the aphids would not live long. They would, they would eventually become extinct. Now my next bacteria symbiont in insects is Wolbachia, which is displayed in these two examples I have. First, right here you have Wolbachia in a few cells right here, right here, down here, and another one over here, right behind me, within this vacuole of this one cell. And then over here you have it highlighted, and if you could notice very carefully, in all of the very bright spots, that's Wolbachia within this one insect cell. Now Wolbachia was first reported within mosquitoes uh, all the way back in 1936. However, it took a little bit longer for them to, to realize its importance. First of all, it is a secondary symbiont, which means it's horizontally transferred. It's not vertically transferred like Bucknera, which means that Wolbachia being vertically transferred has a much wider wider range to go within insects. Which is very important because insects are a large large group of of animals. However, Wolbachia is very very nimble to get into nearly seventy percent of all insect species. Namely spiders, crustaceans, and nematodes. Now how does this happen? I'll get to that in a second, but first the two notable examples of Wolbachia are both mutualism and parasitism. Now there's a, mutualism is very small, it only has two notable examples with normal development in nematodes as well as oogenesis in uh, the wasp, but it's very primary and most known known function is parasitism, it, which is used for male male killing and femin feminization of its insect hosts. Now, Wolbachia. First thing is that you have its mutualistic function that I'll talk about. Then I'll go to its parasitism. Is that in the nematode a tabida, it helps it progress past certain checkpoints that would otherwise kill off the the cell, the very immature cell. But it also helps it uh, invade other species by doing that. See if it is able to turn off the checkpoints that would cause lysis then it can go into another cell and what would normally kill it off is able to nimbly get past that and continue on living in that in that host. Now, like I said, it's able to nimbly get past its host by infecting horizontally through the insect species. In fact, it could infect distant cousins, even though it's not a infected in one species already, if it is infected in a similar species, uh, somewhat of a cousin to between the two uh, host insects, it's able to invade into it. It may not have the same male killing or feminization, but it's, it's able to infect and, and stay in there. Now, how does that happen? Well, some people believe, yeah, it has immunity. It's able to, yeah, cross several tissues that helps it invade lysis. Uh, it's sometimes recognized as part of its host, mostly because of its 
antigens on the outside of its cell, they're probably able to either express its host or keep the its immunity from, from recognizing it. Yeah, like I said, either induces or suppresses uh, immune response. It also is able to upregulate up up uh, its host immune cells uh, to lysis against it. All right. Now that's its function that helps it primarily with parasitism. Now the four main categories it does to to parasitize its host is cytoplasmic incompatibility, which is uh, the infected male sperm is not compatible unless it's an infected egg, which I'll show you in the next slide. But also, it can infect its host with pathogenesis. Uh, chromosomes copy, but they don't divide. It's unable to divide and, of course, replicate. Uh, also, it will cause feminization. It will destroy the male organs in its host, which, of course, will keep it from reproducing. And if a lot of that does not happen, it will just kill off the genes of the male inside the egg with a form of male killing. Now in my next, this slide, uh, you'll see cytoplasmic incompatibility uh, at work. Now, as you can see here, Wolbachia spreads in the wild through uh, its the mosquito population. In the in A, you can see that you have the infected male being with an infect in uninfected female, which will cause no offspring to occur. Uh, probably by male killing, is that the genes just won't uh, will just lysis and die, or that the the cells won't divide. It's probably one of those two. But in example B and C, if I'll move back a little bit, you can notice that if it's an infected female, it will definitely reproduce and produce offspring. And even if it's just the infected male, female itself, it will reproduce and cause offspring. Now, where is this leading us to? How is this applicable in the real world? is in Africa it could be used to control the tsetse fly. Uh, if you're able to get Wolbachia to cause these parasitism functions, it will probably keep it from, of course, progressing and it could keep it controlled to a minimum number or it could completely devastate the tsetse fly population in that area. Primary, res primary research or preliminary research has been successful. However, it's not as important or as widely popular as just established methods of just crowd control, uh, keeping infected uh, livestock away from non-infected livestock. But it is a promising, promising uh, example of what you can use Wolbachia for. All right, now, I'd like to take this time, thank you uh, for listening to me through this talk. Uh, again, my name is Dana Mann. Uh, please check out my next video about squid symbiosis. And thank you for listening.